everybody. Hola, 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 amigos, amigos, players, playwrights, do do that's everybody in between. We're back for another exciting episode of the most fascinating podcast on earth. Yeah. The original, unadulterated, always fresh, and sometimes sleepy game of crimes. <laughs> uh, been one of those weeks, folks. Hey, welcome back. I'm Morgan here literally with my partner in crime. It's Murph. Welcome back, everybody. But you can call him Murph. Yeah, here you go. By the way, have you have you seen that uh, thing on Netflix? It's called Murph the Surf. There used to be, was it a gambler that went? He by was that? a con man and stuff. Yeah, so they're doing this whole thing. He is. You talk about somebody that. How did he score all the women that he's supposed to have? He he. he it's just a Murphy thing. What can I say? Yeah, it's well, the curse we have. Well, he's got a he's got an overbite. Would you say he could eat an apple through a picket fence? So. Oh, geez, I haven't yeah. seen it. I have to watch yeah, it. you got to take a look at that. It's it's it's, a, it's an interesting kind of in the fifties, you know, the the black and white. But they did a big jewel heist, and mm -hmm. anyway, we we digress. That's our first digression in the drinking game that allows you to start drinking no matter what time you hear this anywhere in the world. So, uh, hey guys, but as we get through this, according to the script, it says housekeeping, Apple review, and Spotify. Give us those five stars. Tell us what you think of it. We do thrive on reviews, and so does the rating system and the ranking. It really helps us out. So, guys, just pop on over there. Give us your thoughts. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you like us to keep. What you want us to change, and the things you'd like to hear. We just we pick up a lot of that through our ratings and from your guys's comments. So, anything like that, we truly appreciate. Also, make sure you head on over to our website, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. That's where you're going to see books from our guest we will be talking about. He's got two books out that we'll be talking with him about, uh, and we'll put everything over there as well, GameOfCrimesPodcast.com. Follow us on that thing, that marvelous invention they call social media, um, <laughs> at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes Podcast uh, on Facebook and the Instagram. And also make sure you head on over to Game of Crimes Type in uh, Facebook, just type in Game of Crimes fans. It'll bring you to our special select group. You'll be welcomed into the inner sanctum by our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. Just answer a couple questions. She will deem if you are worthy of entry into the inner sanctum, and you shall be admitted. And therefore, hilarity and other jocularity will ensue. And just uh, on a side note here, Sandy, we're saying a prayer for you. Not sure what's going on with you, girl, but we saw your message. Yeah, I saw your message. Uh, get well soon, and make sure they treat you with respect, because if they don't, we know a guy. We got it. Yeah. We do got a guy up in your area. Yeah. We're going to send him up there, right? So you, you let us know. Yeah. We've got a guy, right? Hey, but where you really got to be, where you got to have fun with this is over at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We just finished up uh, prior to recording this intro outro because we batch things. We do a lot of things at once. We did our Narcometer review of the French Connection, mm -hmm. which will be relevant mm -hmm. to this episode. We did our 911, what's your emergency? Or as Murph likes to say, 119 or 199. 199. That's why... That's why his house is burned down three times. He's called for the fire department. <laughs> Nobody's ever showed up. <laughs> Still um, waiting on him. Still waiting Fireman. on him. Firemen. What I mean, what are you gonna but, do with firemen, right? Yeah, they eat and sleep. You know, they eat till they get they, you know, they they eat uh till they get uh full and they sleep uh, you know, when they're tired. And so and then they go wash their shiny trucks. Yeah, and, but we do love the fire department, but we pick on them and the FBI. It's required. It's in the rules of podcasting. You have to do it. So, but just yeah, guys going over there. We got a lot of we got probably in in terms of hours recorded, more hours on Patreon than we, we may have on our podcast. But we got we cover everything. What you know, nine one one. You can't make this shit up. Uh, we talk about the narcometer, our warden of the throne uh, at our highest level. We talked. Uh, we we talked about the Nashville shooting, mm -hmm. and Murph and I dived into it. Not from uh, all the drama and everything. We just dived into it. What did people know at the time? Stuff was happening, and how did they react? Um, right. We don't deal with all the social issues afterwards and what they might have said because really that's irrelevant for the what's going on at that time. So what's all all that's important is watching the tactics of these two Nashville studs. Mm -hmm. um, so we're referring to them officially at, and we compare and contrast to that to the Uvalde. If, if you've listened to us on Patreon, you know we excoriated the folks down at Uvalde. Excoriate means really take them to task, Murph. That's a big word. You know what this means? Yeah. It means number of friends. <laughs> <laughs> Or in okay. West Virginia, could be what your family tree looks like. <laughs> uh, or how many teeth you have left. <laughs> yeah. uh, da, da, da. Anyway, so but, no, but guys, really a Patreon, that's where we do a lot of that stuff. So head on, head on over there, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. Now, yes. this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take the story seriously, Murph, but obviously according to state law and federal law section, you know, Title 21, uh, Section 18.4. We never take ourselves serious. Just like that code. That's the title 21 is the drug code. <laughs> I know that I was going to use title 18, the criminal code, because maybe what we're doing is a crime. I'm not sure. It's, <laughs> it's all a crime, right? 
But I say that to say this because if it's that time, then guess what time it is? And guess what time it is, Murph? What time is it? It's time. It's time for Small, small Town Police, Police Blotter. Yay! And this week I have decided to pick on the Commonwealth of Virginia because that's where I live. And that's where you absconded from, Murph. You absquatulated. I've, I have lived in Virginia multiple times in my life. And you have left multiple times. I have. Good state. But you don't have the beaches like we have. Well, you do have beaches there. But... Do beaches, but not like you do down there. And it's a commonwealth. It's not a state. Yeah. There you go. That's, there's only 46 states and four commonwealths. All right. Anyway, hey, so uh, I thought I would uh, share with you just some quick notes about what's happening in Virginia, right? Yeah. I love hearing about what's happening in Virginia. Uh, this, this comes to us from Jonesville, Virginia, population 872. Salute. Salute. It's in Lee County. You, can, you don't Lee get County. much past the Lee County Sheriff's Office. What's that? I don't even know where Lee County is. You'll have to look it up. But in Lee County, the, you know, you got to be a brighter crook than this guy was. Anthony William applied for welfare at the Department of Social Services in Jonesville, Lee County. Lee County Sheriff's Deputy, because there's not a police department there to be covered by the Sheriff's Office. Sheriff's Office, Lee County Sheriff's Deputy, dropped by and noticed something a little odd. If you're applying for welfare and you're basically driving a brand new H2 Hummer, Mm -hmm. um, he ran the plates. Um, That don't sound good. Mr. Anderson went to jail for car theft. Oh, I hate when that happens. Look, if you're going to steal something, don't drive it, number one, to the welfare office when it's an H2 Hummer. It's like stealing a BMW or Maserati and driving it to the, you know, unemployment line. You don't go, hey, man. I'm getting, I'm getting food stamps, but look what I'm driving. Mm-mm. I'm driving in style. Well, he, he went to, I guarantee he went to jail in something less expensive than an H2 Hummer. Yeah, baby. That's, uh, and I just found Lee County. That is uh, right where Tennessee, Kentucky, and uh, Virginia come together. Well, way down there in the southwest corner. There you go. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Of course, I'm right. That's where they come together at. You know, you, you guys don't hear me say that very often. Morgan, you're right. Yeah, I, that's correct there. I know, I know my Commonwealth uh, architecture, as they say. Hey, okay. but Steve, you know, one way to get out of trouble is to be a polite criminal, or so this guy thought. It's as long as I was polite, right? <laughs> Dominic Antonio Alfonseca, he posted his latest bank, bank transaction to Instagram in May. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is a couple years ago, but uh, but he had logic on his side. He thought, hey, this is going to hold up in court. What he did was he did a hold up. And he went into a Virginia Beach bank, which I was just down in Virginia Beach. Uh, I should have found the bank and asked him if they remembered this, right? He handed the teller a note reading, I need 150,000 bonds right now. And he put now in capital letters. Please, please take three to four minutes to get here. I would appreciate if you ring the alarm a minute after I am gone. Make sure the money doesn't, and this is all in caps, blow up on my way out. And then he put a smiley face with it. (laughs) So the teller complied, and he was on his way with $150,000 in hand and a video of the whole event. He videoed himself during this. He posted two videos of the interaction to Instagram as well as the photo of his note. And his argument to police, he was polite. He used his manners to ask for the money, and the teller could have said no at any time. As he reported to a local news station, before giving live shout-outs to Michelle Obama, Justin Bieber, and Lady Gaga, I videotaped it. If it was a robbery, I don't think I would videotape it, post a picture of the letter, and do all that just to come to jail. Apparently, he did. Something tells me this kind of guy, it would be the kind of guy who would represent himself in court. Let's hope oh, so. Oh, that's uh, that's the kind of guy when you see him walking down the street, you recognize him, recognize because he's got a capital L tattooed on his forehead. <laughs> Uh, right next to a capital I on the back that stands for idiot loser. Yep. All right, so Steve, and yes. let's end up with uh, some laws in Virginia that you might not know it's it's illegal to do. All right. Um, you cannot use profane, indecent, or threatening language on the phone. This includes the language you used in your text messages. Really? Yeah. You be careful. What, I, what, got, can we use it on a podcast? Oh, shit. <laughs> let's see if that's illegal. Uh, Steve, I got to tell you, I <laughs> just was... We're recording this, and my little uh, uh, messenger popped up. Kevin uh-huh. Black. Kevin, oh, what's he doing? I am mowing and listening to a game of crimes. I promise I've never been to Delaware or shit my pants there. That was tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> and if you wonder who he is, let me get the episode number here. Kevin Black. Episode 86. you got to go back and listen to his story. It's hilarious. Oh, my God. He's and one we did of the funniest people I've ever met. Oh. Uh, all right, well, Kevin, duly noted, duly noted, my friend. 
<laughs> okay. This kid just popped the... No, I see those pop up. They don't mention anything, but I saw Kevin Black and said, shit my pants, I had to read the message. Okay. It's, it's illegal to tickle a woman. However, men may be tickled. This is a this is a state law, and you cannot hunt any animal other than a raccoon on Sunday. You can't hunt it, but if you're going to hunt a raccoon on Saturday, Sunday, however, you must do so by two a.m. All right, um, I, the tickle thing. I don't know. Is that I mean, is that applied to a massage parlor or something? Or as as long as they're not tickling you, they're massaging you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> technically, it's illegal to have sex with the lights on. Uh, okay. Anyway, that, and then that's uh, the, uh, <laughs> and that's a state. Now, here a couple couple counties and cities have strange things. We'll end up with this. It's illegal to flip a coin to decide who pays for coffee in Richmond. It's illegal to wash a mule on the sidewalk in Culpeper. I just drove through Culpeper. Oh, I'm glad you. It's did. illegal to spit on a seagull in Norfolk. Those things are nasty. You should be able to stomp on them and spit on them because they're gonna shit on you. Oh, I and it is illegal for a woman to be out at night in Norfolk. Unless she is wearing a corset and is accompanied by a male chaperone. <laughs> All right, baby. Show us what you got on under there. You got that corset going? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I That's why they call that Norfolk. We could, you, we could have uh, had some fun with some of those, but uh, we want to get into today's episode. Let's get into the stage. So this this one comes courtesy of uh, from Murph in uh when I first heard it, I thought it was Jacques Chirac, you know, mean Jacques Chirac yep. or, you know, one of the bunnies. But it's not. It's Pete Charette. Tell us yep. about Pete real quickly, and then we'll get into the episode. When I was a young agent in Miami, uh, towards my fourth year there, um, and I, we had a new assistant so special agent charge came in over our division, and that was Pete Charette. Pete was, uh, uh, he's a legend in DEA. He was uh, instrumental in getting me to Columbia. He supported me on that transfer because I don't. No, I think he was instrumental in getting rid of you. I don't think it was going. Well, to, it's possible. <laughs> but you know what? And what, one thing we don't talk about in the interview, but Pete, if you're listening, you'll remember this. There was a payback to this when he helped me get Bogota, and I was selected. He came to me. He's like, Murph, you're not leaving yet for a while, so uh, I need I need you to go to Haiti for two weeks, TDY, to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. I'm like, dude, I've been there. It sucks down there. It's horrible. And he's like, oh, he's down there. And I said, okay. So me and a, another agent, Lou Digney, went down there, got there on Monday. That is the nastiest place in the world, or it was back then. By Friday, I was so sick, they met have backed me out. I lost like 23 pounds there, and had only been in country for five days. That is just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if you're from Haiti, but it's a shithole. Well, 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 fortunately, he paid you back because he did send you to Bogota. And because of that, um, we got a little story about Pablo Escobar. And out of that, we got a little story with Pete, the original. Yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about the original French connection, this is the man. You're getting ready to hear all about it. And, and Pete has so many stories uh, we've mentioned before on other uh, recordings that we're doing that he's got two books out. We'll tell you more about those. We're going to post them so you can find them. But uh, we're going to bring this guy back for another interview, probably in a month or two, because he's got so many good stories. You're going to love it. And we had to cut this one off because he started getting to the other one. It's like, dude, we're already at two hours just on this one story. So it was good. But Murph, we're not going to hear about Pete's great charades, his escapades, his capers, unless I ask you the ultimate question. Are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous, and poutine-friendly game of all, (laughs) game of crimes? (laughs) And I now know what poutine is because I thought you were talking about something else originally. But that's another story. You'll hear it on the recording. Everybody get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Let's go with the French connection from Pete Charette. And this is the real stuff. You know, guys, there have been episodes where I said we're going to need interpreters. We need one for Murph. We've had some Southern boys on. Now we have, uh, we've had a couple Canadians on, but we have never had French Canadian to where I have to ask him, you know, is it Pierre or is it Pete? And then he gives me that French Canadian thing. It's like, oh, you silly American. It's Pierre. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I quote what he said. He said, you dumbass. You dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Pete, Pierre, what we're going to do is talk real quick. Murph and I were talking. Um, I just came back from Vegas. I actually ran into Mark Wahlberg because one of our episodes we did with, with, was with Ed Davis, commissioner of the Boston Police. I've known Ed for a long time. We talked about the Boston Marathon bombing. They made the move at Patriot Day about that. And then Murph and I did that on our Narcometer review. But Pete, you've got a Mark Wahlberg story too. We're going to talk about your books, but what was that? So you've got a couple books you've written. you got another one coming out. I think we're going to talk about some of that today. 
What'd you do on what happened on Facebook? He actually replied to you on Facebook, is what you said. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was looking at his Facebook thing, and uh, because I had I'd seen a, a message on Facebook that somebody had communicated with him, so I went to his Facebook site and uh, I just texted him a message on uh, Facebook, a comment, and uh, I basically gave him a little bit of my background and all the uh, numerous cases worldwide that I had made. And I said uh, I was asked uh, by several movie directors to who are in, have in, interest in making a possible movie of a Southern Comfort case, which was the most famous case in the history of the United States uh, on uh, for drug enforcement. And um, I said, uh, you know, uh, I they asked me to submit the names of ten actors who could play various roles of this uh, two-year uh, episode that involved everything, smuggling um, $3.8 billion worth of cocaine and all that. And we became the transporter for the U.S. mob. And I said, um, uh, I submitted your name to play me. And next thing you know, I get an email directly from him and says, please respond to this email. I would like to get to uh, talk with you. Cool. So so we'll see what happens. (laughs) Hey, now, now, when you talk with him, you make sure you tell him about Murph and Morgan, Game of Crimes, and that he came up to me and said, hey, Morgan, I know you. That was – no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Some people got the stroke. Pete, you still got it, brother. Yeah. And let me just say, it's uh, it's an honor to have Pete Charette on on with us today. Pete was in our uh, in our DEA world, our culture. When I was uh, an agent down in Miami, Pete was what was known as an assistant special agent in charge, which puts him in charge of several enforcement groups, which included Group Ten, where I was. And back then, I was trying to get into uh, I was trying to get a transfer down to to Columbia. Got selected for Baron Key and then headquarters and there. Oh, no, no, Murphy, you, you're telling the story wrong. They wanted to get rid of you, and the only place they could find to send you was Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> you tell your story your way, I'll tell mine. Well, but I'll anyway, t- I, I, they, I got that transfer got rescinded because they needed a Spanish speaker right away, and, and uh, Pete stepped in, and that's how I ended up in Bogota. He was very instrumental in getting me there, and we've stayed friends since then. So, uh, honor to have you on here, brother. Thank you so much, and it's an honor to be with you guys. We first of all, before we even get started, we've got a. I was kind of given a hint away. You go, Pierre is your actual name, Charette. Right, Pierre Charette. You, you have an interesting history because you are French Canadian. You know, so it's like Quebec. A eh? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I was born uh, in uh, just outside of Montreal in in the uh, French speaking province, uh, and uh, about. 50 miles from Montreal, a little town called Valleyfield. And uh, the, that's where, uh, you know, I'm fluent in French. So, uh, comment allez vous, ça va bien? Ça, oui, ça va très bien. Très bien. Ah, merci. <laughs> so, merci, Pete. So, con- continue on. But, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, my, my father, when uh, I was young, uh, how I got interested in law enforcement was my first encounter with a police officer. I was coming, uh, going to a, a Catholic school in Valleyfield, the, where I was from, and uh, we were walking towards uh, my two brothers. We were walking towards the restaurant after we left the school. I was the youngest one with my two older brothers, and uh, we came to a traffic light. And uh, there was a police officer talking to a woman. And my brother looked at me and said, "Uh, what are you looking at? And I said, that man over there. And he goes, yeah, that's a police officer, Pierre. And I said, wow, because it just the uniform and everything just something. Was it it RCMP or a local police force? Just a uh, local police officer. And uh, uh, something sparked in my mind, and I said, someday, Gil, and I said, I'm going to be one of those person. I want to be one of those person. And I was only uh, uh, like um, nine years old, and it made such an impression, uh, impression on me. And that, was, uh, that started my goal, and I said, I will become one of those guys one day. And that's how I get. You will started. become a gendarme. Uh, gendarme, we. Oui. <laughs> I, I, I had forgotten about your brother, Gil. 
I, I, my very first undercover role in DEA, we took the undercover boat from Fort Lauderdale down to the Turks and Caicos Islands, and it was uh, Gil Charette and uh, John Mantilla were the boat captains. Yes, yes. My brother Gil, uh, you know, God bless him, he passed away. He was in the Air Force, and uh, uh, basically uh, we had to move to uh, a warm climate because my dad had a restaurant and a very lucrative business in Valleyfield, the biggest restaurant uh, there and all that. And uh, he uh, had to be in a warm climate, so he had been to Florida with his brother-in-law, who was uh, a member of Parliament, Canadian Parliament. And uh, so we moved to Florida and uh, so I was nine years old and we moved to Hollywood, Florida. And uh, so as I grew up, my dad had a um, uh, uh, told the three brothers, he said, uh, I'm going to tell you guys one thing. You're in now in the United States. You will speak French only in the house. And he said, outside the house. You will learn to speak English, and if I catch you speaking French outside the house with your friends, he said the belt will come off. Yeah, baby. Oh, I know what that means. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, six years later, Murph is still trying to master English. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm still trying to sit down from the belt. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, and uh, and I I tell people, you know, if you're in a country, you respect that country. And so I maintain my French. I'm fluent in it, and uh, that has made my career become popular. I, I, you know, not bragging because it was a team effort with uh, all my colleagues and all that. And uh, so I grew up, and uh, next thing you know, I when I graduated high school, uh, I was offered a scholarship. Uh, to University of Florida, and uh, the, uh, I was in a program uh, uh, which uh, you went to school for in the morning, and then you work. It was the, the diversified uh, training program, and uh, so uh, basically they offered me a scholarship when I got ready to graduate, and I they met with my parents, and I had talked to my brother who was a. Uh, 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 in the Air Force, he was a uh, AP, Air Police. He had been in Vietnam, and he was decorated and uh, shot and all that uh, a couple times, and quite a quite a story. But uh, next thing you know, uh, I, I had called him and I said, "Gil, you know, uh, uh, he was in, uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska," and I said, "Gil." I don't want to go to college. I'm sick and tired of school. <laughs> and I said, I want to be uh, enlist in the uh, U.S. Army, and I want to be a military police officer, just like what you're doing. He says, Pete, it's the best job in the world. And he says, go for it. So I, told, I uh, turned down the uh, scholarship, and my dad said, follow your dream. I support you and all that. And I became a military police officer. See, I, I knew you were a good guy. My dad was Army, a World War II and a Vietnam vet. I was in the reserves. But uh, see, I know who are there, soldiers. So uh, so uh, you turned down but, – but let's rewind a little bit before we get too far ahead because I want to ask you a little bit. Because I got to tell you, I was up in Canada one time, actually at a Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police meeting in a conference. I was speaking there. And I'm speaking to a couple guys in the hallway. And they're talking just like you got a little bit of an accent, you know, French Canadian, and they're talking to me just fine. I need you to explain this cultural thing to me. They're speaking English, but when we get up there, he refused to speak in English. He would only speak in French and used an interpreter to give his remarks. Why has there been such a um, division between the English speaking and French speaking? Because I'll tell you that I won a a trivia contest because I knew all three names of the RCMP. The original name was the Northwest Mounted Police. Then it's RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and then GRC, Gendarmerie Royale du Canada. So why why this big disconnect between... Montreal, why is it kind of like its own little world, you know, in Quebec and then everybody else? Well, uh, the Quebec province, you know, that's that's been a battle. Uh, they almost uh, seceded one time. They were like 0.1% from seceding from Canada. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's strange. My, my, uh, my wife is from uh, New Brunswick and the English-speaking province, okay? Uh, St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, over there, uh, you know, they – they referred to us 
uh, uh, Canadians from the Quebec province as, uh, you know, hostile enemies. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always been this ongoing battle. But uh, uh, actually, uh, I have numerous RCMP guys that I worked undercover because my undercover role, which you can speak uh, uh, later, uh, was uh, that I posed as a Canadian mobster on the French Connection, working undercover in France for five years and all over Europe and uh, behind the Iron Curtain and on maiden so famous how many, cases. How many tons of poutine did you smuggle into the United States? <laughs> <laughs> all righty, now. Poutine? Think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. tell, uh, tell more uh, what poutine is. It is like the it, it's like our a heart attack in a sack. They got their own version of killing you up in Canada. <laughs> exactly. Well, the, <clears throat> they're gra- gravy fanatics. <laughs> hey, I got to tell you, that's not at all what was coming to mind when y'all said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we're going to hold on with Pete for just a second because we have something to bring you. This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Now, Steve, I have to tell you, you and I have talked for a long time about the importance of mental health, about getting help. Sometimes it's like being a carpenter or being a mechanic. You need to have the right tools. You don't always have them. Where do you go to find those tools? BetterHelp is one of the places when you're looking for tools to help improve yourself. So this is a lifelong process. It's not something that happens overnight. We grow, we change, we adapt to circumstances. This is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. You know, a lot of times we don't know what we want. You know, how do we get there? How do we improve our jobs? How do we improve our lives? So BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who will take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are to that better self, that better person you want to be. And we're not talking about just going through a traumatic event in your life. You may be at work and and you're taking on more responsibilities and life just becomes a little bit overwhelming. And that's, if you're looking for therapy, BetterHelp's a great place to start. Everything is entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and it's suited to your schedule. So you don't, you know, if you don't have time to do it during your work hours, you can do it after work. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. They'll match you up with a licensed therapist. And here's one of the really cool things about it. If you don't like that therapist, you can ask for a different therapist at no additional cost. A lot of flexibility built into this. So discover your potential with BetterHelp. Now visit BetterHelp.com slash GOC today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash GOC. All right, let's get back to Pete. Well, tell Murph real quick what poutine is, so he knows he got to go out and get some. Uh, poutine is uh, basically uh, uh, like French fries with gravy on it, and then cheese, and uh, they go. People go crazy over it. Hey, brother, put some bacon on there. I'm in. Oh All right. yeah, <laughs> it will. I like it already. Hey, I was in uh, Ontario this past week in uh, the Peel region with Peel Regional Police there, and and uh, we got to talking about the uh, French Canadian side. And even they said, man, it's a different world over there. Well, it, it's amazing when I'm talking to the guys at RCMP, their business cards have French on one side, mm-hmm. English on the other forms. You have to declare, I think, which language you prefer as your primary. So things have to be done around that. Yeah. Except anyway, I just thought it was interesting. It's like, it's like going into the South and getting into Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina. It's like it's almost like having you got to have South Carolina on one side, you know, with the way they speak, and then oh yeah, oh bless oh, your yeah. little heart, bless your, <laughs> you know what that means, yeah, bless your heart. That's basically <laughs> fuck you for everybody else, yeah. So anyway, hey, but, but get back. So I mean, you decided you wanted to uh, uh, basically MP. So where, where did you uh, start off life in the military? Then where'd you go through training? Uh, I did uh, uh, my military police training at uh, uh, F- Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia, and uh, when I I had enlisted uh, because uh, uh, I wanted to go to Vietnam because of my language, French language, they uh, had uh, they said, well, you, we need interpreters in Vietnam right now because of the um, uh, Montagnard, uh, you know, uh, the French speaking uh, uh, section. So I thought I was going to Vietnam. So on graduation day uh, from military police school, um, my orders were given to me and I look and I told uh, my sergeant, I said, uh, something's wrong here. I'm supposed to be going to Vietnam. And this says Albuquerque, New Mexico. Same thing. Hell of a, di- hell of a difference. <laughs> so he goes, Frenchy, go go over to the uh, personnel office and tell them that there's an error. Because I said, that's what I signed up for. 
So long story short on that one is uh, basically uh, personnel said, uh, Pete, uh, you have to go to Albuquerque. They designated you to go to uh, the Sandia base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, that's where you're being assigned. Uh, you're uh, you're you're now in DASA, the Department of uh, Defense uh, Special Agency uh, Unit. And I said, "What's what's there?" You know. And he says, "We can't change the orders." He says, uh, hey, "You're locked in." And basically, this was the base where uh, Sandia the- National Labs. The uh, nuclear bomb was originally made and all that, and they have the nuclear bomb storage uh, uh, in the mountains there. So I did my military police there uh, in uh, Alba, uh, in on Senia base, and uh, I was promoted uh, uh, after being there for a year. Uh, I was promoted to a spec four position, almost like a, you know a, a sergeant and uh, for road patrol and I started making cases besides uh, all kinds of crazy cases and uh, one of them it's a funny story is uh, I was on on patrol and uh, the uh, main gate uh, to the base uh, the MP on on duty you had to stop and uh, if you had a sticker then you were waved through and uh, and here comes this car and he runs the main gate and then heads up the officer's club road and uh, so the guy calling the radio i says i got a guy that just ran the gate and all that and i was coming down and as a result uh, I pulled him over and I was training a new guy. He was from New York. And this guy was a uh, professional boxer. All right. Your, and, your partner or the guy you pulled over? Uh, no, the, uh, he was my partner. I, he was in training, uh, you know. So he was riding with me. So uh, I, we pulled over and the guy was in a convertible with a, uh, his girlfriend. I'll never forget it. A blonde, good-looking lady, and uh, so um, I pull uh, pull him over, and we both got out of the car. And I walked over, and I said, "Sir, uh, you uh, ran the gate there. What's going on? Can I see some uh, identification?" And she, and the girl says, "Go ahead, honey. Show him. Show him who you are." And he looked at me, and he and he gets out of the car, and he said, "You salute me. I am an." Uh, I, uh, I am a colonel, and you will salute me when you address me. And I said, you don't have a sticker showing that, you know, you're an officer on your car, and you ran the gate, and I don't know, I want to see some IDs. He says, you stand at attention and salute me. I said, pal, you're going to be under arrest if you don't show me an ID. And all of a sudden, he started to swing by and clinch his fist. And just as he started to hit me, my trainee boxer cold cocked him right there on the spot, dropped him to the ground. He was yeah. out. One and that's punch. where the famous army line comes in from the MP. <laughs> Sir, do ne- never confuse your rank with my authority. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, anyhow, what happened is uh, uh, he uh, – I got on the radio and called my lieutenant, and I says, you better come down to Oak Club Road because I, we just co-cocked a guy claiming that he's a colonel, and he refused, and he was going to strike me. And Did I he said, look – did he look military? Did he look – no, he, was, he, a- was, he, he, he didn't ha- he look military at all, you know. And so long story short is that uh, Lieutenant showed up and we he finally came to and uh, we got an ID. And <laughs> oh, wait sure a minute, enough, wait a minute. He finally came to. It, how long did it take for this lieutenant to show up? Like 10 minutes? Uh, he was down on the ground, knocked out for about six minutes. <laughs> And uh, so when he came to and we got the ID and all that, uh, you know, he said, I'm a uh, I'm a uh, uh, a colonel uh, on the Judiciary Committee. And he says, I'll have your your guys ass and you guys are going to be brought up on charges. 
So I loaded him up, handcuffed him, threw him in the car, and off we went. Well, we called the uh, lieutenant, called the provost marshal immediately, and the provost marshal came in, and this guy was screaming and yelling. And uh, provost marshal says, Frenchy, uh, tell me what happened. And I told him. And he said, the colonel kept saying, I demand that you release me now. And he says, uh, and the uh, provost marshal says, you're a piece of S. And uh, he said, uh, you keep your mouth shut. Next thing you know, he called the base commander, says, we got this guy. He's uh, uh, with the uh, judiciary. Uh, Was that uh, you're talking about the judge advocate general yeah, court? Yeah, the judge Jag? advocate, yeah. Yeah, so and, uh, like an, he's an, he, he, he thinks he's an attorney. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So uh, the uh, base commander, which was a, a Navy commander, said, uh, he's all yours and bring him to my office tomorrow morning with your guys. So he turned around to, to us and he says, take him to the stockade and lock him up. Yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and we did. And the next day, after we presented our case to the uh, base commander and all that, he gave him a choice. He said, either, either you're going to be dishonored, discharged, and out of the army, and he says, and the other uh, solution is, uh, I'm demoting you one rank, and also you will now formally apologize to these <laughs> military police officers. That was the worst part. <laughs> uh, that's the worst part. That was the embarrassment. Oh, and uh, he took the second option, and um, so that that was my first encounter in this uh, in a funny situation. But I, uh, uh, well, once let's, I let's hold on before we get past that. I got to ask though is. So what was what the hell was he trying to do? Just impress was that his wife, his date, or whatever? He no, just trying to impress his girlfriend there in the car that he was, you know, a colonel and he he could push people around. Well, uh, he met a boxer that <laughs> nailed him right on the spot. So that was a funny episode. But uh, as a result, uh, when I got the uh, uh, in my third year in the army. Uh, I was approached by the uh, 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 my boss, uh, the captain of the c the company, and he said French and the first sergeant. He says, uh, "Would you be willing to represent us for the uh, military police officer of the year award?" Oh, I thought you were going to ask. They were going to ask you to join the boxing club. <laughs> 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 oh, there was a few boxing, uh, trust me, yeah. a <laughs> few incidents. But uh, as a result, uh, you know, I just, um, I said, uh, what does this entail? He says, well, for three months, you're going to study everything about military police, all the laws, et cetera, and, and you'll be uh, interviewed by generals and for the award of the year, military police officer of the year. And I studied, and I said, "Yes, I'll represent us. I, you know, I'm honored that you're asking me." And I was chosen and became military police officer of the year in the army. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I get a phone call from the sheriff's department in Fort Lauderdale, and the sheriff, who was a next provost marshal, uh, he, he read the Army Times, saw my picture, Hollywood, Florida, you know, a boy, and all which that. is Broward County, right? Yeah. Broward County, yeah. Yes. <laughs> So Sheriff Michelle um, uh, called my parents and said, I need to speak to your son. Wait a minute. What was that? Michelle? Is that Mi Michelle? That, that yeah. almost sounds French right there. Yeah, he was. He had a French uh, name. And uh, so uh, uh, my parents called me and it says this guy wants uh, wants to um, uh, basically uh, 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 he wants to uh talk to you and you're going to get a call. And I got a call and he said, he introduced himself and he says, Pierre, he says, uh, I read the army times. Congratulations. You're military police officer of the year. Unbelievable. And he says, uh, are you up for uh, renewal? And I says, yeah, they're offering me $25,000 to renew and do another uh, four years enlistment. He says, nope, you're coming to work for me immediately. He says, how long you got to go? And I said, 30 days. And he says, nope, tell him no. You got a job with me. And that started my law enforcement career. What uh, year was that? 
I beg pardon? Uh, that, that was in 1966. Wait a minute. Uh, you are turning down $25,000 in 1966. Bonus. Bonus. Yeah. In 1966 to re yeah. up. You. Twenty-five thousand in nineteen sixty-six would be the equivalent of probably a hundred grand a day. Uh, yeah, uh, I was only making some like uh, I think it was six thousand dollars a year in those That's days. That's basically four years of pay you just walked away from. Why? Yep. Uh, my uh, my dream was to become a police officer, and uh, so wait a minute. You were just a military police officer. You just got the military police officer. You could have been the first Jack Reacher, and you turned it down. <laughs> it sounds yeah. to me like he was the first Jack Reacher. Yeah, yeah. I, I I did, and um, so I ended up uh, going to Fort Lauderdale, and I went and met with him, and he said, "You're hired immediately, Pierre." And he says, you start the academy next week. And in those days, uh, you know, you didn't have police academies like we have today and all that. He's, the police academy was at the Fort Lauderdale Police uh, Station. And uh, we used to do PT on a uh, on the side of the building uh, every day in, in a little uh, – a uh, hundred square feet of uh, grass, and there was a uh, twenty-five of us in the academy, and uh, so I gra- graduated from the academy, and uh, the my first night to report to duty. Uh, this is where it gets interesting, and uh, where I started getting. I guess uh, that's where all my crazy episodes started, and. Uh, what happened is I walked in, and of course the sar- my my sergeants. Uh, I go in for the briefing on the four to twelve shift, and uh, he I, I reported in, and he looked at me and he goes, "You must be Frenchy, the guy they call Frenchy." The sheriff told me about you. He said, "I said yes, I am." He said, "How old are you?" I said, "21." He says, "You look like you're eighteen for crying out loud!" I soaking wet. 21, but you had four years in the military. Did you join at 17 then? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. No, I had three years in the military. Three. Okay. Yeah. So he said, he said, soaking wet, I, I weighed 145 pounds. I saw your I saw your black and white picture on your site, which you guys can find at peachcharettebooks.com. I saw you in that. I, you look like a popsicle stick with a hat on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyhow, I, uh, uh, we had our briefing and he said, OK, Frenchy. And in those days in the sheriff's department in Fort Lauderdale, believe it or not, uh, the zones were from Dade County, which was the next county over. That's Miami. And then uh, West Palm Beach. Uh, Palm Beach County. So that was our district completely for the Sheriff's Department. So about a 30 mile wide uh, area. Well, there was only five deputies on duty. And uh, that was it. You didn't have partners. You didn't have the trained and all that. You were given your badge. You had to buy your own gun. Salary was $8,000 a year. And and so he says, go get your car. And, you know, so I went down to motor pool and I got my car. He says, also, Frenchie, he says, you're on the 4 to 12 shift. You're in zone one, which covered from the Dade County line, uh, Hollandale, Hollywood, and all that, all the way up to the Broward Boulevard uh, line. Damn, that's a big area. And uh, quite a territory, just one deputy. <clears throat> and as a result... When I uh, went to the motor pool, um, checking my car out, and I noticed that the guy pulls up in a uh, unmarked car. He gets out very uh, big, looked like a football player, uh, elderly uh, guy, and he goes, "Hey, kid, come over here. I want to meet you." So he says, "I'm Lieutenant Stewart." Shakes my hand. He says, "I'm in charge of the vice squad." And he said, uh, let's go talk uh, away from the uh, motor pool uh, office here. I need to talk to you. And he goes, uh, you're the sheriff told me that uh, he had hired a Frenchman. He says, uh, you're Frenchy, right? And I said, yeah. He says, I want you to do something for me tonight. Now, this is my first day on the job. And I said, okay. And he said, now, what I'm going to tell you, you will not 
disclose this to anyone, even your sergeant, and you will do as a, you're told. And this is an order. Well, I thought he was j- kind of jerking me off, you know. So I said, I went along with it. I said, okay, yes, sir. And he said, now, at 7 o'clock tonight, uh, you, uh, you will uh, call in and say that you're having car problems. And you will come and tell and tell your sergeant that uh, you uh, need to get a new car. Your your car is overheating. I said okay. And he said, then I want you to go from the motor pool to the courthouse, which was right right around the corner. Go up to the eighth floor, which was the main floor for the dispatcher and the sergeant's floor and all that. And he said, go to your commanding officer there, the lieutenant's office, and arrest the son of a bitch. Now, I thought he was putting me on. This was a joke. I said, are you putting me on? And he goes, you will do as you're told. You understand me? And I said, he says, and then you take him to the booking desk. I said, Okay. So it's uh, now I'm I'm, a, I'm on my way to my zone and I'm going crazy. I'm saying <laughs> this thinking, not- man, Vietnam seemed a whole lot more uh, more fun than uh, what I'm a about. Lot easier, to do, right? <laughs> yeah. So as a re- as a result, I um, basically seven o'clock. I called in on the radio and, and I said I got a car problem and the, my sergeant uh, says Frenchie on the radio says go ahead make it fast I'll cover your zone and I go to the courthouse. Park the car, walk into uh, uh, the court, uh, go up to the eighth floor, and I'm walking down the hall. And the dispatcher was right across from the lieutenant's office. And uh, I walk in, the lieutenant looks up at me and goes, uh, What are you doing here? I says, uh, I don't know what's going on, but I, I was told to come here to your office. He said, You'll get back on the road now. I says, Lieutenant, I got orders to arrest you <laughs> and he looked at me and he stood up and he put his hand on his gun oh damn and i drew down on him pointed the gun at him i says i got orders to arrest you turn around and i handcuffed him and he's yelling you sob i'll have you fired and all this and the dispatcher is yelling on the radio sarge french has got a gun under lieutenant he's handcuffing him and taking and taking him down to the book you're, and you're having flashbacks to sandia right now aren't you <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> this is the first night on the job this is how my career really started and uh i walked into the book and desk and the sergeant goes what the hell? And I said, I have orders from Lieutenant Stewart of the Vice Squad to arrest this gentleman. And all of a sudden, he dropped his head. He goes, say nothing more. He says, go on back. We'll take care of it. And they booked him. Well, what the guy was doing, he was getting paid by a madam. And uh, she was calling him and giving tag numbers to make sure that these were not undercover cops and oh. all that coming in as clients. And so uh, he got a uh, he got arrested and he went to jail, et cetera. And that was my first night on a job, and that's where my exciting career started. <laughs> I was famous in the department. Charette arrested. I bet you were. Don't don't piece don't piss Pete Charette off. He'll draw down on you, and handcuff your ass. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow! Yeah. That, that's a crappy way of introducing you to the job. The vice lieutenant coming in and telling a rookie first day on the job to go arrest another lieutenant. So- <laughs> I know. But that creates a moral conflict. You've got people of equal rank, right? You got to, it's it's one thing to have a colonel say, or you, you've got an award. But what was it about this vice lieutenant that his word carried such weight that when you walked there and they go, lieutenant, you know, that lieutenant told me to arrest this guy. He goes, okay, say no more. Did everybody else kind of have an idea what this guy you arrested was up to? Uh, apparently, uh, you know, immediately when you say, when you said lieutenant, uh, told me to arrest him, Lieutenant Stewart. They knew Stewart was famous, uh, vice uh, boss, uh, you know, and uh, and he 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 had uh, he had a lot of weight in the department. So they knew something was up. It was an investigation. So as a, as a result, uh, when I came back to uh, 
to, uh, to get off the shift that night, he Stewart was there waiting for me, and he walked over and he goes, "Frenchy, thank you so much. I hated to put you in that position, but he says you'll be hearing from me." Well, why why did they pick you, the new guy, as they say in the army, the FNG? Why did they pick the FNG? <laughs> FNG. Well, apparently, uh, by him being at the motor pool gassing up and me coming on, he looked at me and he, I guess he he was impressed. This this is a kid, brand new kid, and he had heard from the sheriff about my award, uh, you know, in the military. So uh, he just wanted to introduce himself, and then all of a sudden he popped this uh, uh, task on me. And uh, eight months later, I was promoted to detec- detective, youngest detective in the state of Florida. Wow. And uh, that's how I started my undercover work in Vice, uh, doing uh, all, all kinds of things, bookmakers, you name it, uh, working undercover, prostitutions, uh, B clubs. Uh, I made cases like it, it was going crazy and to be very honest with you, and I'm not just saying this, uh, you know, to pump myself up, but I really believe that I was blessed with a special talent by the good Lord. And that was my calling was to work undercover. And I, I uh, basically, uh, the thing that brought it to a, a light, why did I want to do narcotics was uh, while I was on patrol one night, uh, my zone was in the uh, uh, black area of uh, Broward County. And it was a tough zone, believe it or not. It was really tough and great people. And I had the support of the, the, the community there. And, uh, and I, uh, you know, I did a lot of things. And sometimes people would say, uh, uh, you know, my husband, Mr. Pete, I used to stop for coffee. They'd invite me in for coffee. And uh, one woman said, you know, my husband got laid off. Da, da, da. I don't know what I'm going to do. And... I gave her a hundred dollars for the kids to go buy groceries and stuff like that, and um, I I really believe in helping people, and that's always been my my th- calling. So, long story short, on uh, is what happened is uh, I went by a a, a bar a nightclub. It was ringed, and uh, the the, uh, the bouncer at the door. I pulled up because there was a guy laying in the gutter with a bottle of whiskey and it was pouring like crazy and i said this guy's going to get run over so i pulled over turned on my blue light and uh, the bouncer says oh that sob has been laying there for about 30 minutes he's drunk as hell you know so i walked over and he's just sloshed down in the waters running by the gutter and and i kicked him and i said get up and he wouldn't get up, so I leaned down and I started to grab him. And he said, whispers to me, "Get away from me! I'm a cop. I'm working undercover." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I go, "You know what, you piece of shit! You're not worth it." And I dropped him, and I walked back to my car and I drove off. Well, later on, he met me at the motor pool. As I was coming off duty. And was he one of your sheriff's office undercovers? Yeah, he was a nar- – in those days, they only had two narcotics agents working in the sheriff's department for Broward County. What? Yeah, and his name was Joe Clark. God bless his soul. He was a, a Korean uh, veteran, and he had uh, – his uh, right arm had been almost blown off, and it used to dangle. And uh, – Nobody suspected him to be a cop, and he was one of the best, and uh, God bless him, and I loved him to death. And he met me at the motor pool, and he goes, I need to talk to you. He says, you know what? He says, first of all, he said, you responded so fast, and thought, and you, your thinking was so quick, and you said, oh, go after yourself. You're not worth it, and, and you left. He says, I arrested a heroin dealer uh, at the club, and I'm an undercover uh, detective. And 
immediately I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Which is lay in the gutter and get kicked by deputies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Playing drunk and everything like that. So uh, I was promoted uh, to the vice squad. And then uh, three months later, after doing vice work, I was transferred over to the Narcotics Bureau. And then there was just three of us. And then I started making undercover cases. I mean, Right. So when you when you were there back in that day, it wasn't called DEA. It was called BNDD, right? Bureau of Narcotics and well, Dangerous Drugs. And, and, and those, in those days uh, uh, in Miami, it was uh, it was uh, FBN, uh, which was the original bureau, Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And then uh, in Miami, they only had like uh, seven uh, agents in the Miami office. Now they've got several wow. hundreds. <laughs> wow. But um, uh, these were the old timers. Uh, Steve, uh, you know you know what I'm talking about now, and you do, uh, you, you also, Morgan. Uh, these guys were, excuse my French, kick-ass guys. And that, that is not French. That is <laughs> don't, don't insult the French. That is American. Yeah, but uh, they were unbelievable guys and uh, historical guys in the FBN, and um, so they used to use me to undercover for them because they were pretty well known in Miami, and so I used to do a lot of undercover cases for them. And uh, purchases and, you know, uh, ounces of cocaine uh, delivered to me and heroin and all that. And so uh, we had a great rapport. And uh, as a result, uh, I uh, uh, started narcotics. I made historical cases in Fort Lauderdale with the, the three guys, the three of us. And then um, we grew from we went from three to 11 narcotics agent while I was there seven years and I made some of the biggest cases uh, with my, with our team, um, and uh, I worked undercover. I've been. Who did uh, you make the case? So at that time, when you were making cases, were these foreign uh, organizations? At that point, were they American? I mean, when you said you were making cases, yeah, the, were they kind were, of cartel level things? No, these uh, local uh, 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 dealers and uh, you know uh, suppliers, etc. And um, I made a lot of cases and. Uh, uh, Heroin cases. I, I was held, uh, you know, at gunpoint, threatened to be killed. A guy suspected me. Uh, I was a uh, guy flew in from the New York or Puerto Rican, and he uh, uh, that that case uh, always stuck to my uh, mind. Um, I uh, met him in, undercover in Fort Lauderdale, and he had his uh, this guy with him, and uh, my informant was a guy that I had a twist on. And his father was a mobster, and I arrested him with uh, 11 pounds of uh, marijuana, and uh, and I got him to uh, cooperate, and he introduced me uh, to uh, uh, these guys. And uh, so when I met these guys, and I had ordered uh, a quarter pound of uh, uh, heroin, Puerto Rican flew in from New York, and uh, I met him, and uh, surveillance was there. And as a matter of fact, the famous sheriff, uh, Steve, you know uh, him. I don't know, uh, Morgan, if you ever heard of him, Nick Navarro. Infamous. Of Broward County. He used to be an old F FBN guy, uh, a Cuban uh, guy. He was my best friend and mentor. And he was there because he supplied us with the money because the, he was with the State Bureau in those days. Uh, and uh, we didn't have that kind of budget. And uh, so Nick um, furnished the thing and he was there on surveillance. And uh, the guy showed up with this other guy and I met him. And uh, my informant said, you know, uh, I can't make and my dad wants me to do some. So, you know, he'll be there waiting for you at this parking lot and, and the public's uh, parking lot. And uh, so I pulled up and I got out, met the guys. And uh, the Puerto Rican says to me, he says, uh, uh, you know, you got the money? And I said, yeah, I got the money. And I showed him the money and all that. And uh, we're talking and there's a telephone pole there and uh, just by the street. And uh, the guy with him uh, says to him, Emilio, I need to talk to you for a minute. And he pulls them aside and they're whispering and all that. And next thing you know, Emilio pulls a gun, puts it to my head. 
He said, you son of a bitch, you're a cop. And I go, what are you talking about? And um, surveillance people said, the guy has got a gun on Pete's head and all that. Move in, move in. And Nick got on the radio, I learned later. No, 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 he'll kill Pete. Don't do anything. Pete will talk himself out of this. And what happened is the guy's saying, you know, I've been arrested th uh, three times already. And he had a record, a rap sheet, uh, about seven pages long, attempted murders and all that. And uh, so uh, I, his uh, partner said, uh, you were in the courthouse today and I saw you coming out of the courtroom. And I said, yeah. And the guy's still holding a gun in my head. He had a 45. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, I was at the courthouse. So you were at the courthouse too, huh? He says, yeah. He says, you're a cop. I said, no, I'm not. He said, what were you doing there? You were in the courtroom. I said, I'm on probation, you son of a bitch. And I said, you know what? I said, I had to appear because I didn't report in and the judge admonished me and said, if it happens again and you don't report, you're going to prison. And I says, what were you doing there? Yeah, turn the pages on him. And I turned it around on him. And I says to his partner, I said, why don't you put the gun on his head? What was he doing over there? How do I know he's not the cop? And the guy said, well, I was reporting to the probation office. I said, okay. So what's the problem? Yeah. Are we good So here? the guy lowered the gun, <laughs> right? And I and, said, and, oh. Didn't you tell them, can't you tell by my outrageous French accent, I am not an American cop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So as a result, he gave me, the, uh, he pointed, and there was a package by the pole. I got the package, gave him the money, and then he went to his ex-wife's house, and that's where he was staying for the night. And then we raided the house, and uh, when uh, we got to the, if you're familiar with the Florida, you know, the jealousy window doors, you know, little slate-type doors, uh, glass, uh, Nick, <laughs> crazy Nick, uh, we got to the door and the guy, the jealousy windows doors were, uh, windows were open and the guy was sitting on the couch watching TV. And then when he saw us, we yelled police, you know, you're under arrest, opened the door. And the guy started to run and Nick took his fist, slammed all the jealousy glass with his fist, dove through the door and <laughs> dove over the, <laughs> over the couch. I'm not exaggerating. This is really, yeah, but I don't exaggerate. And I thought the I said the mad Cuban's gone nuts, right? And he dives on top of the guy and he starts pounding him. And he said, "You son of a bitch! You wanted to kill my friend. I'm going to kill you." <laughs> this was Miami and, Vice before Miami Vice was cool. <laughs> yeah, and and we arrested him and all that. And um, when I was transferred and hired by DEA to go to France because of my, they needed a French-speaking agent, fluent French-speaking agent, not State Department uh, uh, French. And that's how the, they had put out a notice uh, that they find us a fluent French-speaking agent who has narcotics experience to go work on the French connection. And uh, because uh, Nixon... What year was this? This was in 1973. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash game of crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash game of crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two.